Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackle for Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. This Saturday, October 28th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., there'll be trick-or-treating at the museums with free admission to the museums for visitors wearing a costume. We'll also have the third annual Monster March costume parade at 11, so plan to bring your little monsters to see us then. Many of you know our staff member Hezekiah Watkins, who became the youngest freedom rider when he was arrested in Jackson at age 13. He'll be giving gallery talks on two Saturdays, October 28th and November 4th, at noon in the Central Gallery of the Civil Rights Museum. If you haven't heard Brother Heck talk about his experiences, you owe it to yourself to come and catch one of those. And then I hope you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when Beverly Gage will present J. Edgar Hoover and Mississippi. Gage was scheduled to be with us just days after it was announced uh, that she'd won this year's Pulitzer Prize for biography for her book, G-Man, J. Edgar Hoover and the Making of the American Century. She had to reschedule her history as lunch. We're excited to hear from her next week. So come back for that. Today, I am delighted to welcome back Christopher Slocum to present A Land of Sickness and Death, Weather, Soil, and Geology at the Siege of Corinth. And I say welcome him back, not because he has done a history as lunch before, but he gave a condensed version of this talk at the Historical Society annual meeting earlier this year. It was fantastic, and as soon as I heard it, I said to him, you've got to come back and talk to us for History's Lunch. Christopher Slocum is Assistant Director of Admissions at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. He earned his BA in Political Science and Communication Studies from Marquette University, and his MS in History with Distinction from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Slocum's current work includes a project exploring race and Civil War memory in Corinth and a piece on Freedmen's education and post-Civil War military occupation in Old Tishomingo and Alcorn County. Help me welcome Christopher Slocum. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being here today. I'm, I'm thrilled to join you here in Jackson. Um, I, as Chris mentioned, uh, I work professionally at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And frankly, I don't make it down to Mississippi nearly as much as I'd like to. So always love coming down here. Um, thrilled to be with you for this series. This is actually a series that I watch regularly from my home in Omaha, uh, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. It's an honor to be here. Special thank you and a heartfelt thank you to Chris Goodwin uh, for bringing me down here um, and giving me a, a chance to share with you all this afternoon a little bit about my research into the environmental history of, a siege, uh, of the Siege of Corinth, which is, if you know anything about the campaign, uh, is a relatively understudied campaign. It's a campaign that flies... Uh, under the radar. And thanks to you all for spending a bit of your lunch time today uh, learning a bit more about this, this campaign. You, some of you might already know a little bit about it, others might be coming in clean slate, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the campaign, a little bit about my environmental angle on the campaign uh, today. I was joking with some folks earlier, actually, that uh, of the slate of really great History is Lunch talks, I'm probably a candidate for the most depressing title uh, of, of, all, of all those talks. So uh, thank you especially for coming after yeah, and not letting the title dissuade you uh, from, from having a lunchtime talk about disease and sickness and illness uh, at this campaign. Uh, my, my kids routinely ask me, uh, my, my nine-year-old son John and, and, and my 11-year-old daughter Hazel, they ask me, you know, Dad, there's all these really interesting Civil War topics. Why did you choose disease? Right? And I say, well, look, you know, there's a whole suite of, of topics that I'm covering. I'm, I'm, I study Corinth uh, and Alcorn County in a variety of ways. I'm working on pieces, as Chris mentioned, about uh, Confederate memory, uh, contested memory, union, uh, emancipationist memory, and Confederate memory in town. I'm working on another piece about freedmen's education in Northeast Mississippi after the Civil War. 
Uh, and of course, this, this topic about disease. Uh, and so my son saw this land and sickness and death. He said, you know, I love you, but I don't know why if I had come to the talk based on the title. Um, so um, I'm excited, excited to be here. But this, this quote actually comes from an Iowa cavalryman um, who was writing to his wife uh, near the end of the siege in the first couple days of June, 1862. Uh, And he was lamenting to his wife that the disease uh, in the Federal Army, at the U.S. Army, during the Siege of Corinth was so bad that he was thankful to be alive in this, quote, land of sickness and death, right? He considered the, the land itself, nature, the environment, as harmful to him, to his comrades, to the Army, despite their success Uh, in the program, or excuse me, in the uh, campaign. And what I want to, I think it's helpful to to really lean into the fact that there's not a lot of scholarship about the Siege of Corinth. A lot of people know about it, right, because it is a large campaign. About 175 to 200,000 soldiers total were, uh, were, you know, took part in this campaign, which roughly took about two months. And it's an understudied campaign. And it seems to be, you know, alongside my, the, uh, the Mine Run campaign in Virginia, the Tullahoma campaign in Tennessee, there's these major campaigns that frankly don't have a lot of scholarship around them. Tullahoma campaign was recently addressed uh, pretty fully. Um, but there's, there, the Civil War, despite the really rich literature out there, has not much scholarship on the Siege of Corinth, uh, despite the fact that it was the first major incursion by a U.S. Army during the Civil War on Mississippi soil, right? There was a, a handful of units that quickly occupied Ship Island, Mississippi, right down there in the Gulf, as a prelude to, the, uh, to taking uh, New Orleans. But this is the first major land army that is, is uh, coming on Mississippi soil. Uh, and it, and it's, it's interesting because it oftentimes, you know, flies in the face of, of, uh, of kind of, you know, the size of the campaign itself, given how many soldiers uh, were occupying the land between Shiloh and Corinth and Tennessee and Mississippi. You'd think it... Um, you'd think it would be studied uh, more, but it it hasn't. It oftentimes uh, plays second fiddle to Shiloh, right? The Siege of Corinth took place right after the more famous Battle of Shiloh, which took place on April 6th and 7th, 1862. Um, Despite the fact, despite the fact that Corinth was actually a bigger affair and a longer affair, Shiloh was certainly a bloody fight. Two days, and you probably are very familiar with the Battle of Shiloh. This this, uh, siege of Corinth took place right after the Battle of Shiloh, and it was a bigger and a longer affair, right? And I think there are many reasons for this, you know, scholarly, um, you know, oversight, or some would say neglect. Um, Yeah, there are fewer casualties in this campaign. There's only a, a few hundred casualties as compared to Shiloh's many thousands. This is a really wide, like widespread sickness during this campaign, so it's not a really, like my son thinks, it's not a very exciting topic to study for a lot of folks, right? Um, and it's a slow campaign. It's an arduous campaign, and there's not many. The, the, the two generals involved in this campaign, Henry Halleck and PGT Beauregard, don't have sterling reputations in Civil War historiography, right? Um, thankfully, Tim Smith, who many of you might know, uh, Tim, Tim, Tim Smith provided the first scholarly overview of this campaign in his Tennessee River campaign series, right? It's, it's, but, he, but he would be the first one to tell you that the siege remains an outlier in the otherwise rich scholarship uh, of the Civil War's Western theater. Um, there's a lot more that we can and should unpack about this campaign. And so I think it's helpful for those uh, uh, in the room here who might not be super familiar with this campaign. As I mentioned just a second ago, Corinth is the culmination of the Tennessee River campaign. And I I will share to you, there's some fancy looking maps in this presentation, and there's some very unfancy looking maps in this presentation. So that's a a, a quick preview there. Uh, This this is a, a, a fairly comprehensive map about that Tennessee River campaign that culminated in the capture of the strategic railroad crossroads at Corinth. 
Ulysses S. Grant, with the, with the Army of West Tennessee, leaves Cairo on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with this. In February 1862, he takes Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, opens up Nashville. Most of, most of North Central and Western Tennessee fall under federal command, uh, or federal control, rather, as he advances with his army and with the Union Navy fleet down the Tennessee River, disembarking at uh, Shiloh. Uh, on the west bank of the Tennessee River. And of course, the Confederates, reeling from their defeats at Donelson and at Henry, um, they coalesce, uh, uh, coalesce excuse me, in, uh, at Corinth, and they strike a blow back in the Federal advancing army at Shiloh. Of course, they are defeated there. The Federals win, the Confederates lose, they head back to Corinth, and then the siege of Corinth is what happens after Shiloh, when the, uh, a combined three armies advance on uh, Corinth, the strategic crossroads. This campaign takes place over two months, from April 11th, 1862, all the way until June 12th, 1862, so it's roughly about eight or, eight or nine weeks. Both armies reorganize themselves. There's a lot of reorganization going on after Shiloh, and they're preparing for what many of them believe in the army, both soldiers from the privates on up to the generals, and many in the northern and southern press believe will be the largest fight in the Western theater that will dwarf what just happened at Shiloh. There's a lot of anticipation. And so there's 20 miles connecting Shiloh uh, to Corinth, and, uh, and, and this is relatively undeveloped land. It still is very rural uh, part of Tennessee and a part of, uh, of Mississippi, with relatively unimproved roads. These are, these, this is very primitive land that Halleck and the Union forces need to traverse in order to complete that Tennessee River campaign and take the strategic railroad crossroads at Corinth. Okay. These are the uh, two commanders, um, old brains, Henry Halleck on the left here, who was a military intellectual, despite his uh, academic stature and later uh, as commander uh, or, or uh, general in chief of, of the Union armies, uh, this is his, the Siege of Corinth is his only field command. This is the only field command he takes throughout the entire war. So major figure and this is his only uh, experience as a field commander. And then, of course, one of my favorite uh, uh, names in all of Civil War uh, um, uh, history, Pierre Gustave Totant Beauregard, right? P PGT Beauregard, uh, the hero, one of the heroes of Bull Run, but who, ha but who has fallen into disfavor with Jefferson Davis, is, of course, the uh, commander of the combined two Confederate armies in the Western theater defending Corinth. So, so this, repu th th uh, this campaign has a reputation, as I said, of being a slow campaign and a very sickly campaign, with thousands of soldiers, both on the Confederate side and on the Union side, succumbing to and suffering from different types of disease. And it was this reputation for sickliness that attracted my attention, that I thought, frankly, was ripe for analysis given the rich literature of the Civil War, I don't think we have um, dug into Western theater sickness, illness, medical care as much as we need to. And to begin to tackle this problem, I needed to break off a, a section of it. And I said, you know, I'm going to focus on disease in the U.S. Army during the Siege of Corinth. These guys had the most ground to cover during this campaign. They were the most active during this campaign. They were the most impacted by the weather. And it struck me that they would be a really uh, key candidate in terms of investigating illness and the reasons why sickness was such a prominent feature of the Siege of Corinth, right? Because dis it's, it's an interesting story. They succeeded in maneuvering Beauregard out of Corinth. They won this campaign and yet traipsing over those 20 miles between Pittsburgh and Hamburg landings on the Tennessee River and Corinth uh, in northern Mississippi, their casualties by disease and disability actually rivaled what they just suffered in battle at Shiloh. Thousands of soldiers 
were uh, furloughed, discharged from the army, remained sick in the army, or died during the campaign, and those numbers rivaled what just happened with rifles and cannon at Shiloh. So as Halleck is moving toward his three armies toward Corinth, as he inches his way towards that, as he builds entrenchments at an almost feverish pace, especially halfway through the campaign towards the end, as he parries threats from Beauregard, Beauregard tries twice, on May 8th and 9th, and again on May 21st and 22nd, to attack Halleck, as he parries threats from Beauregard, his soldiers are suffering from, in many cases, a combined disease environment of acute diarrhea, dysentery, typhoid, malnutrition, and malaria. And in some of these cases, they're actually suffering from multiple ailments at the same time. I'm glad you all finished eating already. That's exciting. <laughs> Right. So one Ohio soldier uh, wrote later about his experience at Corinth and saying, quote, it is safe to say that there was no two months during the uh, balance of the war where so many men in our regiment were placed hors de combat as during the siege of Corinth. And given the fact, I dug deep into soldier letters, diaries, reports, etc., and what, they, what soldiers routinely said is that the environmental conditions, the water, the weather, some of the land itself, were making, it, were making them sick. They hated the landscape in southern Tennessee and northern Mississippi. They blamed it for their bowel issues. They blamed it for the sickness destroying the frame of their comrades. And so I thought an environmental lens might absolutely be the way to hopefully tackle an aspect of this problem. And I was inspired by what's called the green turn in Civil War scholarship. Some of you might be familiar with the inroads that environmental history has made into Civil War scholarship, right? It has fruitfully complicated a lot of what we know or what we think we know about the Civil War. People, so scholars now study agriculture and politics and slavery and battles through an environmental lens. So I really recommend, uh, if you like this presentation today, feel like this is a good lens, try to tackle uh, 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 some of these books relating about familiar topics from a new angle. Michael Woods at the University of Tennessee has actually called this green turn uh, it, it has created in his eyes a, quote, civil war that is at once more richly human and more widely resonant. And I think that's true. We're paying a lot more attention to things like mental health and the mud on the boots and taking them seriously. One, one scholar, Ken No, who's uh, retired now, but he used to be at Auburn, uh, he one time quipped, he said, you know, the civil war was fought outside. And, and that's funny, but it's interesting because we tend to prioritize humans and human structures over the natural world in which we all exist and depend on, right? So it's taking seriously, it's putting, putting nature back into Civil War history. For my purposes, Ken No, Judkin Browning, and Timothy Silver have together written uh, a, a really interesting set uh, of military studies that have made use of the natural sciences. And they've demonstrated that natural sciences can and, frankly, should be a key part of our military analyses of campaigns that we might think we know all about. In particular, a tenant to this new scholarship is uh, what's called a biological exchange. And, and Brown, uh, Browning and Silver make, make this point well. They said, essentially, as humans act on the environment, it's important to recognize that we exist in an exchange with that environment, that as we act on that environment, the environment in turn acts upon us in its own way, right? We live in an interconnected relationship with the natural world, and any comprehensive historical analysis need to attend to that relationship. And I view uh, this as especially pertinent to conversations about sickness. So my guiding question as I was uh, looking at the correspondence from these, these two gentlemen and their subordinates, was how can we use an environmental lens and employ the natural sciences to understand illness at Corinth? 
How might that lens frame the way we view what one of the things this campaign is known for? I wanted to do three things. I'm going to take a quick drink here. I wanted to do three things with this uh, scholar, uh, with, with my research here. I think it's important that we expand this body of environmental analyses of the Civil War to include one of the war's sickliest campaigns. The numbers of sick demand it. The guys suffering from typhoid, malnutrition, and malaria, their story needs to be told, in my view. Lisa Brady, who's at Boise State, said, uh, wrote about a decade ago, she said, every campaign deserves an environmental interpretation. We need to take that seriously. And I was also troubled a bit by some otherwise fantastic medical histories of the Civil War that had, it seems to me, it seemed to me like a, like a almost knee-jerk kind of reaction of calling what happened in middle eight, mid, um, the middle of 1862 in Virginia on the Peninsula Campaign worse disease environment than what was happening on the Tennessee River. And that might be the case, right? It might have genuinely been a worse disease environment in, during McClellan's Peninsula Campaign than it was during the Siege of Corinth and during the advance up the Tennessee River. But frankly, we don't have enough research on that to really make that argument. One scholar called uh, what happened on the peninsula a landmark medical disaster. And that, again, might have been the case. But I think it's important that we plumb th what was happening in West Tennessee and North Mississippi before we, or to, to, to better see if that's actually the case. Um, and I also think it's helpful, too, to broaden the geographical reach of environmental interpretations of the Civil War. The South, as we all know, is a very different type of South landscape, climate, weather patterns in Kentucky versus on coastal South Carolina, the bayous of Louisiana, North Mississippi, even here in Mississippi, very different ecosystems, different worlds, different regions environmentally. And I think we need to broaden the environmental corpus to include all those areas because the biological exchange took different forms in North Mississippi than it would in the mountains of Georgia or the bayous of Louisiana. So we need to, again, broaden the geographic reach and lastly, I think it's important that we increase the scientific depth of these environmental interpretations. People have used, uh, scholars have used nat uh, natural sciences, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist, um, and I really wanted to dig even deeper. I thought, you know, there's got, there's got to be a little bit more when we're talking about soil and geology. I also wanted to introduce into Civil War uh, soldier studies this idea of biological balance, what I guess physiologists call, uh, might call homeostasis, the idea that there are many different things, a dynamic set of factors that are working on, uh, the human, uh, on human health. We all know, right, that if we don't sleep well, if uh, you are eating poorly, if the weather is bad, you are stressed out, all of these things contribute to potentially sickening us or making us healthy. And it's, you know, if, if the health care is bad, if our behavioral practices and the leadership around sanitation is bad, all of these factors go into this uh, piece that I call bi um, biological balance. It's what I call a 360 degree view of health care. Um, so importantly, like, the, the weather, the soil, and, and the geology, which I'm, which I'm going to talk about next, were not the only factors of sickness during this campaign. My point is that we need to, they need to be part of the conversation because they were a critical part of that health. So all of these things were a factor during Corinth, but I'm going to focus on the material aspects of nature because it helps illustrate why Halleck's soldiers wrote so frequently about the environment in their letters home, why that Iowa cavalryman considered the land one of sickness and death. And he wasn't the only one who had col colorful quotes that way. Other northern soldiers called the Mississippi countryside godforsaken, an almost barren wilderness of quicksand and mud. And uh, one of my personal favorites, a miserable, desolate, swampy, ill-fated hole. <laughs> These guys didn't spare words when they were writing back. Some of that was because they had a northern cultural disposition to see southern landscapes as sickly. There was an understanding that the south was a sickly region in the northern mind. But I argue, and I think it, it's 
pretty clear, that those statements are equally reflective of their experience with nature during a grueling eight weeks. Soldiers understood this intimately. So if there's one thing you take today from this presentation today, it's that understanding disease at Corinth requires us to grasp the role material aspects of nature played in altering that biological balance of Halleck's soldiers. And I'm going to focus, as I said, on three different pieces, weather, soil, and geology. All of these I'm going to investigate on their own, but it's important to know. They, they, they are factors not only in and of themselves, but especially because they work together. And that dynamic, that mosaic of factors, is a really interesting uh, part. I mentioned weather first because it's important on its own, but it actually helps contextualize what I'll say with the admittedly more complicated pieces of soil and geology. So I'm going to dive into uh, weather here. And um, it, it's from the top down, kind of a bird's eye view. The campaign took uh, place across essentially two phases, what I call the wet phase and the dry phase. Uh, the wet phase from April 11th until May 5th, you'll see here that it, it rains uh, over half of the time. Whereas in the dry phase, May 6th through June 12th, it actually, precipitation falls during uh, uh, less than a third of that time. And it, an important feature of this is during the wet phase, when it rains, it's a harder rain, the sky is darker, it's far cloudier, it's overcast, it's miserable conditions. So it rains more frequently, and it's a more miserable environment. Whereas during the dry phase, it rains less than a third of the time, and it does so not only less frequently, but less intensely. Right? The sky is not as dark. So it's a pretty stark contrast here that way. Where uh, in the dry phase, only four days saw more than light intermittent showers. And this is a weather calendar that I created from over 160 different manuscript sources that I called all across the country to give you a sense of just what that weather during the Siege of Corinth looks like. You see during the wet phase, there's a ton of black, right, which is hard or consistent rain, and then the gray is light or intermittent rain. So there's a lot more black during the wet phase from April 11th to May 5th. And then during the dry phase, there is some precipitation in there, but there starts to become large chunks of time with little or no precipitation. An important piece to this, actually, that uh, May 11th, which is in that, in that middle right side of that May calendar, I had to put that in there because McClernand's, uh, a part of the Federal Army in the Reserve, got rained on. But it was a passing storm, so the rest of the army didn't get any rain, but the guys in reserve got rained on. So, but I still felt, to be honest about the material, I needed to put that in there. But it's important, because if that's, that, that light storm, there's essentially two weeks where there's no precipitation. There's no precipitation. And it's important to know that during this wet phase, Halleck soldiers struggled as they prepared for the siege. They struggled with appropriate shelter accommodations. They, some, uh, many of them had no tents. Those that had tents often had damaged tents, right, because of the Battle of Shiloh. Some of them left their, uh, uh, in Buell's Army of the Ohio, left their tents and their baggage back across the Tennessee River in their haste to get to the battlefield. John Pope's Army of the Mississippi, which Halleck called east from Island Number 10, where he had just successfully uh, reduced uh, a Confederate fort on the Mississippi. His soldiers arrived April 22nd and April 23rd, but, and they have better equipment. They're doing a little bit better, but they had to endure that rainy weather in the Mississippi Valley on top of crowded steamships on their way. And they uh, arrived in, uh, in Halleck's army, as one soldier said, completely worn out. In fact, one of Pope's soldiers admitted to his wife, this is actually a, uh, a collection here uh, in the Winter Building, a uh, Wisconsin soldier wrote his wife and he said, yeah, we're wet most of the time. Right? Ever since they arrived, we're wet most of the time. So many soldiers during this wet phase had to improvise shelter from tree branches. They made little coops and dens from what they could grab around the Shiloh battlefield. And remember, it's raining nearly the entire time and they have freshly buried corpses, just a week or two old, buried pretty shallowly close by. So the stench, what's, what's happening with the stench is also uh, marked. There's limited medicine for these soldiers during the wet phase. 
Resources remained meager. They hardly had any fruits and vegetables. It, the food was nu uh, nutritionally deficient. Many of these guys were on half rations during that wet phase. Right? So in those conditions during that wet phase, sanitary discipline, probably pretty predictably, they, it waned. Water sources fouled and the numbers of sick began to climb. And what happens is that they start to develop the array of illnesses during that beginning part of the campaign that is acute right at the moment, but carries with them. They weaken their bodies throughout the rest of the siege of Corinth. Army doctors acknowledged what was happening. John Brinton, who later created the US uh, uh, Military Medical Museum, several months later after Corinth, he said the type of disease which was chiefly a camp fever, assuming more or less a typhoid form and attended with great fatality. The violence of this affliction arose from several causes. The chief cause of which, uh, causes of which were the insalubrity of the campsites, the impure water, and the scanty supply of fresh meat and vegetables. So what happens is these generalized weakness from multiple ailments, which is a condition that Civil War surgeons referred to as debility or rheumatism, was almost ubiquitous. Acute diarrhea, dysentery, and typhoid were epidemic. Pneumonia and lung-related maladies were prevalent. Smallpox and mumps even made their appearance among the soldiers at the time. Very common was jaundice, which is a sign of an amoebic dysentery parasite in the liver or of viral hepatitis. Jaundice and mumps actually continue throughout the siege. Again, sickness happens during the wet phase, and in many cases, it sticks with these guys throughout the dry. The mosquito-borne malaria, right? Malaria comes from mosquito bites, is a little bit less frequent in the, dry, or in the wet phase than it is in the dry. But it still was prevalent enough that a lot of guys had chills that would accompany their bowel discharges, which some surgeons said uh, happened for some soldiers up to 30 times a day. And we know that ailments like poor nutrition, malnutrition, scurvy, malaria, can exacerbate already, um, already sickly bodies, which leads to things like not just acute diarrhea, but chronic diarrhea and a greater chance of death. So I argue that it's these multiple maladies happening all at the same time that killed or disabled many of Halleck's men. Leaders worked hard to improve the sanitation throughout the campaign. In fact, I'm writing a related paper right now um, that, where I argue that the high levels of disease after Shiloh actually compelled military leaders to expand the, uh, the medical infrastructure, change the entire trajectory of Union medical provision in the, in the, in the Western theater, right? The siege occurred at a time when that medical provision was really rudimentary. And I argue that this campaign in particular, what we see is we see the beginning of broad con uh, convalescent hospitals in, in, the, in the Western theater, more attention to sanitation. But my point here with weather is that Halleck's men began the campaign, or the advance part of the campaign in late April, already sick or their bodies weak from the trials in the wet phase. And they were then ill-equipped to deal with the relentless labor and anxiety of the rest of the campaign itself. Because as we know, heat breaks down human bodies, particularly if they're already weakened from previous bouts of diarrhea, dysentery, and typhoid. So then, and then the dry phase, I'm gonna give you a couple points about the dry phase. Some of these days were quite nice. They were really spring tight. They were warm during the day, cool at night, beautiful sleeping weather, I love that. Um, but a lot of these were not that nice, especially for northern bodies who were unused to heat and who were weakened by uh, that wet phase. In late May, one soldier said it was 104 degrees in the shade. And unsurprisingly, that same day, you've got a soldier in the 26th Illinois who keels over dead when he's building entrenchments clo closer to Corinth. His body likely weakened from insufficient food and exertion. The day before, May 28th, the 13th Iowa Infantry returned from picket duty, uh, picket duty, and they found a guy who was suffering from diarrhea, but who was up and about hours before he too died in the time that they were out on picket duty. So this is a really arduous campaign. So weather and exposure to the elements was a significant factor in creating illness. But weather is also a factor when I'm going to talk about soil 
which is an admittedly more com uh, complicated piece. And I, I think it's, it's uh, helpful um, to j just to lean, lean into the fact, I'm a big believer that dirt matters. <laughs> right? We, and we know this, especially here in central Mississippi, right? Maybe your house foundation has cracked because of the shrink and the swell of Yazoo clays, right? We, a lot of us here know that, uh, um, and that has consequences. So, uh, soil can also be um, you know, sufficient, like wonderful things for food crops, right? They can help doctors make antibiotics. They help regulate the earth's temperature. Some, some people I remember in college uh, used soil as a beauty mask, right? They had mud masks. So you've got food, you've got medicine, you've got beauty, you've got all sorts of stuff. Um, but some of those attributes that soil has that actually helps life flourish can also have negative effects on human health. In particular, a soil's ability to retain pathogens, disease-causing pathogens, in the first layer of that soil. It, so soil can be a disease vector in addition to a house foundation destabilizer or an anti, uh, uh, antibiotic assistant, if you will. So this is the most basic thing I could find in terms of uh, sand, silt, and clay, the three major soil types. And we know that water, when it hits clay, has a different impact on the soil. It percolates down much more slowly than silt, which itself per uh, water percolates far slower down than sand, right? Water goes through these soils at a different rate because the pore sizes are far larger with sand with sand. So water passes through these at different, it pools with clay and some silt, um, and so it behaves differently. And of course, this has consequences for, the, for what's happening on top of the soil. And what I, what I uh, did with this is I actually pulled some data from the National Resource Conservation Service. These are actually the same, same, same chart. Um, where the, the, the soil profiles of, what was, uh, of the Siege of Corinth area are listed there. You see here, these are actually really heavily silty, silty soils, really, really heavily silty soils. And Halleck's army spent most of the wet phase in Hardin County, which is exceptionally silty. And in fact, it has the lowest percentage of sand of all of the whole area. So when rain hits these soils, when rain hits these soils, it is more likely to pool and to run off because there's a little bit less space for it to move down into the soil. Importantly, imagine what happens to the soil in terms of compaction when you have uh, uh, roughly 100,000 men tramping down the soil and in many cases closing those soil pores further. It makes weather, uh, uh, water a little less likely to then uh, go th down through the soil as well. It's more likely um, to stay longer on top of that uh, soil because it binds more closely with the tighter soil particles. And Corinth area, especially where Halleck's army was just across the Tennessee line, was an especially sand, low, sand poor zone. So drainage was a terrible thing. I, I seem to be, I, I'm going to get into my map-heavy section, and, and, and you have to forgive this amazing clarity uh, on the, on the uh, uh, screen here. This is a, 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 a map of the hydrology of Tennessee and, of course, North Mississippi as well. Hydrology of the landscape was a major part, not just soil texture, but hydrology of the landscape was a major part of what made those uh, soils uh, drain very, very slowly. It's a, cri it's a critical factor, right? So the Mississippi, and the, uh, this is the Mississippi River right here, and of course the Tennessee River, and the Corinth campaign took place across what I call a, a winding plateau. This is one of those bad maps I was talking about earlier, right? So it's a, it's a very rudimentary map, but I've actually put Corinth right down here. You see that black dot, and then on the Tennessee River, you see Pittsburgh and Hamburg Landing. Hamburg Landing is just to the south of Pittsburgh Landing there. And this campaign took place on what I call the winding plateau between Pittsburgh Landing and Corinth, where some of the streams did, uh, uh, moved east toward the Tennessee, and some moved west toward the, Hatch, uh, toward the Tuscumbia, which goes into the Hatchie, which then goes into the Mississippi uh, River. All right? So now usually a plateau would drain the soil 
a little bit faster. But the Tennessee River, as we know, runs north. And the Tuscumbia and Hatchie run north. And any river running north moves much slower than any river running south. So this plateau actually drains far slower than your typical plateau. So not only are the soils bad with drainage in the first place, but the hydrology of the landscape itself created a situation where the land stayed wet for a longer period of time. And the third factor in, in, uh, that I want to talk about in soils uh, is what's called a fragipan. And when I first heard that word, I kind of ch uh, chuckled a little bit. Some of the soil vocabulary that soil scientists use is quite, quite interesting. Um, this is a restricting layer that in, in the soil, typically about a foot and a half to three feet down, that, that uh, limits the easy draining of water. And don't pay attention to these, these colors here. These are different, the colors represent different types of, of fragipans. But as you can see here, fragipan soils largely defined the Mississippi Valley. And of course, in northeast Mississippi, southwest Tennessee, fragipans are everywhere are everywhere. So what happens in this, uh, in this case is that as the consistent rain during the wet phase hits that already wet soil, particularly with fragipans, because fragipans help perch water in the top layers of the soil, it results in what soil scientists refer to as a flashy response, where water hits those other supersaturated soils and quickly runs off the landscape. And the most uh, uh, the most populous soil in Hardin County, where um, Halleck's Army was, are what's called paid and silt loams, which include a fragipan. So it created a muddy mess where you have streams of runoff going across the landscape. The ground was so wet and the runoff was so pronounced that men actually needed to work to ensure their safety. Francis Tupper of Illinois, another cavalryman, commented that, quote, some of the boys who had not dug a ditch large enough around their tents to carry off the water soon found a stream running through them that would run a sawmill. We have to work all day, he said, to keep from being drowned out like rats. So this means two key things for health. First off, and this is getting very human here, the runoff washed the, the, uh, the fecal matter from the diarrhea-stricken soldiers more hastily into their water sources. One 15th Ohio soldier, he, they said the only water they had uh, to eat was full of diarrhea. And the soil was a huge part of that, was a huge part of that. The second thing, as Halleck begins his advance, the soils couldn't hold much more rainwater. So when it rains and they're trying to advance, they're literally tramping through mud that would, is like almost biblical in proportions. It's silty, it's clayey, they can't move, it's awful. One soldier called it a sea of mud. And the roads weren't that very good to begin with, right? One uh, Union general called them narrow, unimproved dirt roads. And then of course the rains flood the creeks, which take out the bridges that the army built forcing a rebuild. And remember, this is, this is an era where there's no dredging or canals on the creeks like they exist today. So just real, real quick, before I get into that, I want to show you some examples of a fragipan. Now this, is, this just looks like kind of average dirt, but you see here about two feet down what begins what's called the fragipan right here. That's the fragipan, that third layer where, so, where water can't has a much harder time getting down. Here's another close-in example of that fragipan where parts of that soil become cemented. So, and here's a cross-section of that fragipan. This is a little bit blurry, I apologize for that. But you can actually see the dark brown parts of that. That's cemented soil that uh, is impervious to water. So it limits free draining of water. Here's what Lick Creek looks like today in southern Hardin County and southeast McNary County. It didn't look like, see all the dredges and canals? It didn't look like that in 1862. It looked like this. Worse, I, I love this, this random boot right here that's stuck in the mud. Or this box of ammo, or I don't know, know what it is, but it's stuck. These guys are having a real hard time going through. Here's another drawing written by, or uh, drawn by one, one of the soldiers. And this, of course, delayed rations getting to the front. This delayed rations 
getting to the front. The 6th Iowa Infantry on the Army's right went without full rations between May 2nd and May 9th. It's a full week without, without consistent food. So Fragipan dominated soils compacted by thousands of feet on a supersaturated, slow-draining plateau created a mess for the Army columns, and it helped create a disease atmosphere that was really problematic. And the final thing I'll talk about today, this actually is, a, is a, a, what I talked about earlier with the hospitals. This actually is a very glorified view of what was the first near battlefield convalescent hospital in the Western Theater established at Hamburg Landing. And the final thing that I'll talk about today is a little bit about geology and topography. And I think it is, is, is helpful uh, to first kind of give you a sense of what, because this takes eons. Geology is a really slow moving type of thing, right? Land forms over eons. Most of Mississippi, really the entire state, exists under what's called what used to be an inland or, or a shallow sea called the Mississippi Embayment, all right? And you can actually see here that this, this inland sea eventually becomes the Gulf of Mexico because it starts to recede. And this is actually a, a, sci a, a scientific uh, study that actually shows over many different years, hundreds of years in many cases, how that Mississippi embayment recedes. And you'll notice there's, it leaves different type ribbons of sediment behind. And what we have here is the coastal plain, right? The Gulf Plain that exists now. We know that this is part of the, the lower regions of, uh, low, lower lying regions of the South. Mississippi Valley is right there. Uh, and, at, and here is another geological map that actually shows, I think, in uh, really stark terms, the different layers of sediment that that Mississippi embayment leaves behind, right? Of course, this geology, the sediment that it leaves behind, uh, has consequences. Here is a current map of current Mississippi geology, and I want to focus particularly on the northern part of the state where a lot of that, those ribbons of sediment are especially pronounced. You'll actually see here that pale blue color just to the right of the uh, neon green uh, is, is what's called the Selma Demopolis Formation or the uh, more well-known Black Belt, which uh, exists uh, in the northern uh, and northeastern counties of the state, uh, all the way uh, from Noxabee County all the way up to Alcorn. And here's Corinth's location in Alcorn County on the eastern edge of that Selma Demopolis formation. Here's a little bit of a look, uh, uh, a, a, uh, another view of the Black Belt that goes all the way up to southern Tennessee. Here again is northern Mississippi, and now I'm going to zoom in once again as to Corinth is the red, and where the Federal Army began its advance is the blue. And as you can see, the Selma Demopolis Formation is right across the path of Halleck's advance. I created this geological map. This is a very zoomed in view of what those geological formations looked like as Halleck's Army leaves the river and goes toward Corinth. And as you can see, eventually all of the Army, but especially the reserve and, 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 and the right center part, occupy this, this chalk formation um, right when the weather turns from wet phase to dry phase. And one of the things about the Selma Demopolis formation is that it's impossible, it has no, you cannot get water in the formation. It's impossible to find water. And the soils on top of that Demopolis formation often don't have any internal water table either. So what was a quick or what was a muddy mess quickly turned into a situation where soldiers could not find water, could not find water. Here's an example. Again, I pulled the uh, soil data. This is the Octibia soil, which is named for Octibia County, obviously, but it's part of the Selma Demopolis uh, formation. And as you can see, it exists right, uh, right all around Corinth, but especially just north. And I have overlaid that, those soils. The, these are the soils that have no internal water table that exist already on, a, on top of a water-poor formation and they're right in the path of Halleck's advance. Right in the path of Halleck's advance. They, soldiers became desperate. They had to dig wells. But unsurprisingly, they met with very little success. What water they did obtain was warm and brackish, and the frustration was palpable. One Wisconsin soldier wrote home saying, good water is as scarce as honest men in Wisconsin. Again, colorful language. The Ohio and Ohioan said, we can get a little dirty water close to camp, but it is not fish, uh, fit to wash out of. 
The further south we go, the water gets worse. And this is why. Because half of the army moved into the, the Selma Demopolis formation, which is unable to provide water. Now, Pope and Buell's, uh, the left and center uh, wings respectively, had better access to water because they only get on, on the Demopolis formation there right at the end. But the water there still wasn't, wasn't very good, right? So Halleck's men understood the quality of what they were drinking, but they had to drink it in that wet phase or risk dehydration. But as we all know, drinking polluted water itself results in dehydration. So Halleck's soldiers probably uh, suffered from both types of uh, dehydration that's identified by modern physicians, hypertonic from low water intake and excessive sweating, and isotonic from salts lost due to uh, uh, profuse diarrhea, for example. One soldier in the Ohio, uh, 11th Ohio Battery said, there are some 15 sick and unfit for duty in our battery. Notwithstanding, this may seem like a large percentage. I assure you, this is the healthiest body of troops I know of. And another soldier simply said, There's, we, we do bury, uh, buryings every day. The last part that I'll, that I'll show here, and this, this is a key part as well, and I know I'm running low on time, is the physical labor it takes to create a supply network across a primitive landscape should not be over, it really cannot be overstated, right? So the, the soldiers, that the soldiers had to build roads across the landscape to provide even a consistency of food, which often wasn't nutritionally uh, beneficial, that they had to build these roads with inconsistent food, poor or scarce water, with their bodies already weakened from the trials in the wet phase and ongoing struggles with water in the dry, explains why illness persisted throughout the siege and why the siege of Corinth is known as a sickly campaign. It's that constant exertion, that relentless exertion brings bodies to their breaking point. One union surgeon called it bodily degeneration, and he was correct. The longer the campaign ground on, and Halleck was really slow, he made sure that he was going to capture Corinth. Halleck's slow advance ensured that he maneuvered Beauregard out of Corinth, but in doing so, he submitted his soldiers to nature-based stressors that made their bodies break down that altered their biological balance, and in thousands of cases, fatally. Thank you, everybody. So I'll, I'll uh, happily take, take uh, questions um, about you disease, question, you can raise, sickness, yeah. <laughs> Corinth, raise anything you want. And we'll bring the microphone to you. Your last picture there uh, leads me to wonder what, whether soldiers talked about the fate of their horses. Uh, yeah, um, a lot of them actually, horses got stuck in the mud and couldn't move. They actually had to shoot some mules because they couldn't move and they were blocking the road. So yeah, they did. Uh, horse, horses routinely broke legs. Uh, in, in, and when a horse breaks its leg, it's really tough to, to, to recover from that. So yes, that's actually, there's actually some really good environmentally related scholarship now coming out about uh, uh, horses in the Civil War, animals in the Civil War. It's kind of a subfield of environmental studies. Yeah, thousands of casualties of horses as well. Great, great, great point. And we often forget about the horses just like we forget about nature. So, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, what is your particular interest in Corinth? It seems like you've done several studies in that area. Do you have a connection, or is it just a random? No, it's, uh, I'm, I'm actually originally from Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> yeah, could you? Okay. <laughs> um, so, no, I, I don't have uh, any, any you know, familial connection or, or uh, personal connection to, to Corinth. I always was attracted to Western theater military historiography, um, and it always seemed like an understudied campaign. And I was really taken with the fact that so many soldiers were in this really slow campaign, a lot suffering from sickness. Um, and I've always also been fascinated with Mississippi. Given my background in Massachusetts, like 
I remember growing up as a middle schooler and high schooler, no other place in the country seemed so not Massachusetts, <laughs> right? Um, and yet, like, as distinctly American, right? And, and so that, uh, that difference was something that attracted me. So. Could you just give us a word or two about the military history that grew out of this environmental situation? Tell us just what happened for those of us who may have forgotten what we once knew about that, about the Battle of Corinth. Sure. So the uh, Federals, of course, maneuver Beauregard out of Corinth, and they capture uh, this strategic railroad crossroads. Uh, and they occupy Corinth for almost until January 1864. The Confederates try to retake the city in, in the fall of 1862. Uh, September and October uh, of 1862, there's the Iuka and Corinth campaigns. Van Dorn and his Confederate army fails to take Corinth in October of 62. Uh, and so it remains in federal hands until f the Federals abandoned it uh, in very early 1864. And of course, Corinth then becomes one of the biggest sites uh, for, um, for uh, enslaved people self-emancipating themselves, right? the Corinth contraband camp. So it's this campaign that takes that strategic railroad crossroads, which is militarily important, but for the human side of the war, it is exceptionally important for the many enslaved people looking to gain freedom. And the contraband camp in Corinth becomes, becomes a thing because of this campaign that takes that strategic railroad city. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, I think my question is somewhat similar to the last question. Um, I'm, trying, I'm wondering, why is the Union Army successful, victorious, when they're coming from the north, invading, they are less familiar with the southern conditions, where, the, where, where in the climatic conditions and other environmental conditions, they, they're not as familiar as the southerners who were, who were living there. So why, were the, why was the Union Army successful when they are dealing with conditions that are more suitable to the southerners who are familiar with the conditions that, 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 that are, exist in the south? What I'm trying to find is what, 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 why was the Union Army successful when they are invading and less familiar with the conditions that existed in the South? Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, great, great question. Um, it, it, I, the best thing I could say is it was the, the art of making do. <laughs> they, they, uh, they had to bring the rebellious states back into the Union, right? And that required a military and, uh, you know, endeavor of huge, huge proportions. And so they felt like they had no choice. Um, and they learned on the fly. Many of them learned on the fly. Um, prior to the war, as I mentioned before, the South, at least in the Northern mind, really in the popular American imagination, had a view of the South as a sickly countryside. And so they knew on some level what they were getting into. They knew that it was the yellow fever was a thing along the coast. Malaria was very, very uh, you know, prevalent. They knew about the famous Mississippi mud but they had to do it. And they attempted to make the best of a bad situation. And they learned on the fly. It was really amateur hour for the first year or two of the war. And that's relating to my research that's, that's part of this kind of broader project that I'm doing is that, that learning on the fly in terms of medical infrastructure and policies relating to who gets discharged and who is counts as sick and who leaves for a furlough happens during this campaign. So this campaign is very much in the, in the stream of learning on the fly, not just in terms of moving bodies of men towards cities with military consequences, but even how to care for such a large body of soldiers that need that health care. I, um, I, I, I want to pre-reference this. Um, um, concerning your comment about, about Massachusetts and Mississippi. Yeah. I, I, I lived in, in Cambridge, okay. um, but, but I grew up here. Um, but I, I don't want to get into that. I just want to pre-reference it because 
Uh, as soon as, as you were speaking, I was thinking the way uh, your, your pronunciation of, of, of these uh, places is uh, um, very, very northern. Um, <laughs> so your, give it away. Yeah, I give it away. That's fine. Your current, um, I, I, I grew up with it, current. Yeah. And, yep. um, and, and, and I wondered um, why you, you refer uh, to it. This is the first time I've heard anyone r referring um, to campaigns uh, as opposed to b battles or military operations or whatever. Um, but but I do appreciate the different perspective that you are presenting here, but but it's not not very much in in the layman's level. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's hard to make science exciting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and 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 so. To, to you know, talk about soil pores and runoff and, and geological formations is, is, you know, it's perhaps why environmental history kind of took a while to take off, right? I don't, but, you know, to me, I, I'm a spatially oriented person. I love maps. I love, uh, you know, the, the, the ridge lines and, and, and uh, soil formations and the different types of trees. So that's kind of how I, I'm oriented. Uh, and so it just seemed like a, like a kind of a natural, pun intended, uh, place to 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 investigate this campaign or military affair or battle or other other places. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We have come to the top of another hour. Don't forget the things that we have coming up: the trick or treating um, and the gallery talks by Brother Heck, and also next Wednesday's History's Lunch by Beverly Gage, who again just won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction this year, and she's going to talk about J. Edgar Hoover and Mississippi. For now, help me thank Christopher Slocum for this fantastic program today. <laughs> <laughs>